I mean, looking at it from a public safety standpoint and like the regulators having to make sure that the public is safe and making sure that, you know, the state of California is being responsible for this massive billion dollar industry, that's how they felt it was best to regulate it, right? So to bifurcate it into these like these uh, slices, if you will, and then really have oversight over each, and different, each individual section. So they are able to really track the entire production line from seed all the way up to consumer. So those extra little things that I'm adding essentially give me extra points. Yeah. So then that way it's not just, okay, we have a security company, it's fine, check the box. It's really being thoughtful about how you can be efficient or mindful or a yeah. co good community leader, but in a way that's presented to a, a municipality. Mm. Cannabis businesses, or at least a lot of them in Northern California, are upheld to the standard where we have to give back. It's like part of the business, it's part of our agreement with the city that we have to give a percentage of our profits or donate a certain amount of time to the communities. So that's something that cannabis companies are adhered to that are mm. are great and other and really other companies should be held to that same standard. What regulation has done is basically forced this almost impossible standard on growers to not use like harmful pesticides and have all of these nasty things, toxins, that used to be regularly found in cannabis. If you took raspberries from Whole Foods and put it under the same microscope and held it to the same standards as cannabis, it would not pass. But knowing that our industry now has developed methods of growing at mass production scale that can pass our super strict testing regulations, that's a huge win. And that was a win because of government and that was a win because of the regulators. Children, like especially three-year-olds, their face glitter, their eyes twinkle because they don't understand stress, they don't understand time, they don't understand deadlines, and they are they just sparkle. And it is the most beautiful, hopeful, happy thing in the world. No, someone's opinion may contradict yours. Where's my friend Alan? It's all about your perspective. Who are we and what is the nature of this reality? Five, four, three, What's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host Alan Sakian. We are on site at the beautiful New West Summit, the Cannabis Tech Conference. We are now going to be speaking with Salwa Ibrahim. Hi, Hi. Salwa. Hi, Alan. Thank nice to so meet much. you. Thanks so much for coming of on the course. show. Really appreciate it. Very excited for this. <laughs> Me too. Super <laughs> pumped. Salwa's background is super interesting. He's been a pioneer in the California cannabis industry. Opened and operated numerous dispensaries and cultivation extraction facilities totaling over 50 million in sales annually through multiple states. Yes. Oh my goodness. Okay. So, and also the first cannabis dispensary to do an IPO. That's correct. Bloom. Plant touching, yep. Yeah. Okay. So, let's talk about this. Um, what have you been up to? This is obviously really hard to know how to do this with the regulatory frameworks that are constantly changing. Uh, so yeah, how have you been handling that? And what are you up to now, making things maybe a little bit more efficient in those processes? Teach us about this process. Well, it's funny from a certain standpoint, I'm lucky because I've been doing it for so long. Like I got in the industry in 2008 and back then reading the regulations was pretty simple because there really weren't any. And so, um, <laughs> so following the rules was, was you know, a challenge, presented in its own set of challenges. But when working with the city of Oakland and then the, what ended up being the state of California and just forming those regulations, I got, I kind of have a rolling start. So, um, you know, back in those days, you got a dispensary permit. Well, that was the only permit type of permit that existed. So it allowed you to do everything under that license. So you were able to cultivate, extract, uh, essentially distribute, transfer. There was so, a myriad of different platitudes that you gained with that one permit. Um, so in that sense, I learned a lot of the industry just because of the lack of regulations and we, I happened to have a dispensary permit. And then once California came on and Prop 64 passed and they started uh, having all these different types of license categories, uh, you know, we just did our due diligence and like watched the process and um, became involved once, you know, regulations wouldn't necessarily suit any cannabis business and kind of helped reform to make them more viable. 
Whoa, so interesting. So like the codes get updated over time and then that directly affects all of the different components of the industry in, in, in different ways. And it's, it's important that they make the processes less uh, frictionful, more frictionless and more able to be efficient and creative and uh, do the medicinal benefits and the textile benefits and all these other things. That's correct. Um, yeah, the, 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 pro the regulations as it stands today definitely has a, a process, like everything's bifurcated. So like for instance, you can you have a distribution license, but you can't move it without a transport license. Then once it's sent out a transport license, then you go into retail, then you need a retail license and so on and so forth. So- A license at every? Pr practically, yeah. And Whoa. then there's a lot of procedures, especially for extraction and for, um, and for edible making, for instance, like those are several different licenses. So to make your edibles, like the oils that go into your edibles, and depending on your process, that could be one to two different types of license. And then to infuse your edibles is a different license. And then to um, package your edibles is a different license. And then to move your edibles to retail is a different license. This seems extremely bureaucratic at the same time, although it's for safety as well, of course, uh, but it seems heavily bureaucratic and in a sense making it, I guess, difficult for something that used to be just growing, easy. growing out of the <laughs> ground and us to be able to leverage for whatever purposes we wanted now is... Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, there's definitely, I mean, looking at it from a public safety standpoint and like the regulators having to make sure that the public is safe and making sure that, you know, the state of California is being responsible for this massive billion dollar industry, that's how they felt it was best to regulate it, right? So to bifurcate it into these like these uh, slices, if you will, and then really have oversight over each and different each individual section. So they are able to really track the entire production line from seed all the way up to consumer. Um, so from that standpoint, I understand it from a public safety standpoint. And uh, to be quite honest with you, at that time when Prop 64 passed, the industry was asking for that. Like we wanted to be taxed, we wanted to be regulated because we wanted to understand where we stood so we can talk to investors, we can get additional yeah. banking and funding and, and invest in our businesses without um, having the risk that the city would shut you down or you wouldn't be able to get your your whatever, like uh, expand your business. So in that sense, it was kind of, it was, it was the middle ground. Yes, yes, okay, so both opening up more for venture investment and financial contribution to actually happen, to accelerate, put some f fuel into the fire of the industry, but also not make it overly bureaucratic where it's hard to actually, like if you need a license for every single one of these tiny little steps, um, it can make it maybe a little bit more uh, complicated, overly complicated. So it's interesting to see how then those, the most optimal code gets written and like different countries have different codes. And so do you, do you feel like, um, where was the, I, which, uh, which market did it that I blew my PO? So Bloom, um, rolled up to Terratech on the OTCQX. OTCQX. That's correct. So it's the closest you could get to the NASDAQ uh, without being on the NASDAQ. But it's, oh, it's over the counter, okay. essentially penny stocks. Which a lot of the market has is living on that exchange because NASDAQ has these requirements that quite frankly, like Whoa. nobody can really qualify for. Okay. And obviously everyone's wink, waiting for banking reform. Interesting. Okay, so then what um, what OTCQX? That's correct. What makes them able to uh, like IPO cannabis stuff? But uh, you know, like what is written in their codes that enables that? On that particular exchange, yeah. I wish I knew the details to be able to articulate it to your audience. But unfortunately, I'm that's I, I'm an operator. I'm a cannabis yeah. girl. Yeah. The, everything I do know about IPOs and uh, the stock market and taking your company public, I I basically learned by living through it. Yeah. So um, just being forced to take these take the knowledge from the attorneys as I was going through my deal. Um, but my understanding of the OTC is is kind of like buy it at your own risk type of investments oh. like in the sense that like you know they're not like you could buy a lot of different types of oh, yeah. 
company stock on that exchange. Yeah. But once you move over to the NASDAQ, there's so many different requirements that qualify a company to be on there. You have to be trading at a certain dollar price, a certain volume. You have to abide by certain regulations and these much stricter um, standards to be on that exchange. And it's all kind of about safety in that sense is you, you take your risk like you said on a like an OTCQX versus like a NASDAQ. Interesting. Then maybe that is uh, the combinatorics, the little permutations that can be run is you have maybe like a state like Colorado or Washington or California that have their own little different regulations packages that people have to follow and then we see what is the best yeah. and uh, people get to like move with their feet into the ones that they want to. Well, I think that it's, it's interesting because obviously like the state of California when they were starting to, to put their process together, they went and looked at Cal um, Colorado, Nevada. There's a, I've seen a lot of the, um, the process and the procedures and security measures and things like that cookie cuttered over from Nevada. And they went out and they kind of did their research and their homework of like what worked, what didn't work. And this is what they came up with. Now, I don't necessarily think that the state of California is um, unwilling to amend. I think that we can work together as an industry and as a regulatory body to work together to amend the policies to actually make sense for the business. It makes sense for, for all of uh, just making it more efficient. An example that I have mm -hmm. is um, we just did, uh, so Highland Events was the first company to basically buy um, I'm sorry, sell cannabis at a major mainstream music festival that outside wasn't. Outside lands, right? That's correct. Yes. Outside lands that wasn't on a county fairground. And so that was a very intricate process, getting all of the brands' product in and, and being able to sell it. Mm -hmm. However, there is this one law in our policy that says that I need to have all of the staff who's going to be working um, at the event, their names and their shifts planned. 72 hours before the event and then submit it to the state, right? Oh, wow. And I can't add names. So come Friday, everyone's like, oh, oh like they're, everyone's grinding. But Saturday, people don't show up on time. They don't show up at all. I'm short staffed. I asked to infill, can't add more staff. So there's these like little, there's these little policies that I think are easy to change and that, we're, that I believe the state would be willing to hear us and listen to why they don't necessarily work and we would work with them to alleviate any of their concerns, but it just, some of them don't necessarily make sense in practice. Yeah, this one is really interesting. Like uh, so many of us have been to the bigger festivals and to have like little cannabis experiences at those festivals um, is really important for people to uh, safely and also um, in a very curated way be able to um, experience uh, their, um, their augmented uh, states that they want to yeah. partake in at these cool events. And so, like, when you say something like uh, Saturday someone might not be showing up that I had to register 72 hours beforehand, like, to me it seems like, okay, well, we can create an, such a, a, a process of such efficacy where you can literally, in the, even within a government, even within a regulation, where you can just submit something as simple as a, a, a license, you know, of mm -hmm. this person and an ID, and then just for that to be immediately inputted, scanned, vetted, whatnot, mm -hmm. and then just to give you that simple check mark back, here's their ID for the event and right. whatnot. Like this, we our processes have a little bit of ways to go, but I, yeah, I like, I like where you're like you've you're. How do you do that? Like if you did say something like that, where do you even go in like this to deal with a state? like an augmenting process or like when you were talking about all of the, um, another thing you were just mentioning was this copy and paste from different states. Mm -hmm. Like part of that also we've been talking about in the Valley for a while has just been companies just copy and pasting their like data standards or whatever from different companies or taking the, the incorporation standards. And it just, what it does is it also just makes everything homogenous and it, rather than trying new creative combinations that could potentially work. Yeah, right. so what are your thoughts about stuff like that? I mean, as far as like, sorry, was it my thoughts on specifically like uh, copy and pasting policy or let's you mean like how do you both. change? Okay. Yeah, let's do both of those, exactly. Okay, so I would say that in order for anybody to like um, have change, the best way to do it is particularly in cannabis because that's the only example I have. But like the way we've been successful is by working with your local government first. 
So for us, when we went to, with outside lands, using that as the example, we would work with the city of San Francisco and be like, oh look, this is where we were short staffed this one day and this could have been way more efficient and we would have been out on time, blah, blah, blah. Can we have your support on trying to amend this one thing? And then you get their buy-in. And then when they're having conversations with, you know, the regulatory body in San Francisco, or I'm sorry, in the state of California, obviously like their opinion means a lot to the state. Mm -hmm. So they can help advocate for the same thing that you're advocating for because it's efficient and it makes more sense. And it's again about public safety. And if you're short staffed at an event like that, that's not okay, right? So who is the person within San Francisco that you would talk to that would then talk at the state level? Uh, Marissa. And, so she was, okay. she basically is the, the head of the Office of Cannabis. Okay. So, so most municipalities. The head of the Office of Cannabis. <laughs> exactly. So <laughs> most municipalities either have their own cannabis department right now, or in Oakland, for instance, it goes through the city administrator's office. So if, if it's an event, you might do city administrator's office depending on what body regulates what portion of the business that you're trying. It could be special activities, if it's a retail, if it's, you know, so on and so forth. So having, having buy-in from your local government to then help advocate from that side. Now on the other mm -hmm. side, you want to advocate for yourself. So there's two ways that Good I... Quick question before you get to advocate yeah. for yourself. Where would the city, so then the city rep talks to at the state level, who do they work with at the state level usually, do we know? Um, so for, in this particular instance, it would, it would be basically the, the um, Bureau of Cannabis Control. So oh, the Bureau of Cannabis Control. And that's correct. usually like a board or a representative. Yeah, so Lori Ajax runs the Bureau and Alexis Podesta. They basically are run everything cannabis in the state of California. Interesting. So, so the San Francisco or the LA reps work with these the state yeah. reps. And then they then amend the codes which then make it easier for you to do the things like that. They they could. So what we would end up doing, it's usually not that easy and it's, it usually takes a very long time and it, the best approach is to hit it from multiple sides. So that's just, you've got one side there, and right? the other side. So the other side is you have to advocate for yourself and there's basically two ways of doing that. One, the state holds a lot of meetings where they want to hear from the public, they want to hear from the businesses, they want to know what works and what doesn't work. Attend the meetings, join, mm. Like mm. go, talk, yeah. Yeah. email, it, like inquire. That participation is absolutely key. So participating. Then if you have the means to do so, having a lobbyist or somebody that's in Sacramento that's there basically full time to be able to like, mm to advocate for these changes. If you got the money, because that's a lobby, full-time lobby is expensive. Full-time lobby is very expensive. And, and if some people can do it and some people can't, like for the amendments that I would like to see changed, they help everyone across the board. Yeah. I can't just be like, oh, only Highland gets this one. You know, it's if we advocate for these simple changes, they're to the benefit of the entire industry and all of the different companies. Therefore, so, it could be crowdfunded then for multiple uh, parties into that uh, a lobby. Correct. That's so, cool. so could be, and then you'd have to be very organized to do that. Or you can find people who have like-minded interests. So, just using this as an example, we have Emerald Cup, we have High Times, we have all of these other uh, Chalice, we have all of these other main huge festivals that would benefit from a part of this amendment. Mm -hmm. Just to use it as an example. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, cool. Cool. And then um, also like the, the Coachellas and Lollapaloozas and all these other places as well, when they also want to get their own uh, cannabis experiences happening there, they'll also benefit from it. I like exactly. this. I like this. I like this a lot. Like kind of like pooling in time, money, resources into updating the codes that then get uh, dis the benefits get distributed, democratized to the masses. Exactly, and then uh, if you if your companies can't afford a lobbyist, like leaning on them and their lobbying team and their legal team, and then just showing them, they're like, hey, you know, I'm not sure if you ran into this issue. How do you account for it or whatever? And then maybe they maybe it's not an issue for them, and they can teach you something that is is beneficial that you don't you don't have to face that issue again. You know. Let's let's do an interesting thought experiment here with. Uh, um, we're talking about like this copy and paste issue that sometimes happens where everyone just becomes homogenized right. in the way that they do something. Um, and uh, it kind of, it can inhibit creativity from actually happening. If you were to maybe like, let's say press reset mm -hmm. and be able to like play in Salwa land and uh, you know. I like Salwa land. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> we all this is a designer <laughs> world. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm just yeah. kidding. <laughs> we will all have our designer worlds, uh, yeah, in our virtual augmented experiences, and it'll be very interesting in the future. Let's say, okay, we'll take us to Solo Land. You have um, this magic wand. You get to set the the frameworks for how. Uh, uh, even just the small community could get to you know experience or a town let's say or however much size so again scales matter here but wh how would you see things um, being frictionless but safe and efficient um, wh what kind of pieces would you put together um, to let you know like free market forces go at play but also safely yeah, yeah. it's hard it's that's a tough one to answer. I mean, if I had a magic wand, I would just like make everybody play nice and like we don't need mm. like, a lot of oversight because we just don't need it. But early playing on. Playing nice, playing nice. There's people not playing nice. No, nice. I just mean in, in, in business, it's like everybody does what they say they're going to do and so you don't need contracts and whatever. This is in La La Land, right? Oh. So that's what we're talking oh, about. Okay. And in to bring it sort of more into reality, one. Proposition 19 came before Proposition 64. And Proposition 19 basically proposed that the governments, the state of California give local control to each different uh, city and county to create their own laws and their own processes. Which becomes a little difficult when you are planning an event or doing something in a different county and because you have a whole different set of laws and to abide by, which Whoa. is happening now. But ultimately what that would have done is, is allow cities to create their own different license types. So for instance, the city of Oakland could just have one edible license type and that's it. And it takes you from end to end for edibles mm -hmm. or extraction. And you can have any type of volatile solvent or whatever solventless extraction methods. Um, I think just simplifying the processes will just open up naturally the ability for other people to get in and compete yeah but yeah and what would an ideal like simplified process look like to you ideal simplified process gosh i've been in cannabis for so long it's never been simple mm -hmm. it's i mean what at least from my standpoint like i i responded to my first rfp when i was like 24 25 years old rfp so, again yeah, so a request for, proposal. request for proposal. So typically how these how a lot of licenses work, there's there's two types of licenses that you can get. Now I'm going to shift over to retail. Let's okay. just do use retail. Okay. There's ones like in the city of San Francisco where they're kind of land use based. So it's more about the real estate and the community and making sure you're in a good neighborhood and your neighbors aren't mad that you're there and things like that. And you're like not that. near a school. Not near a school. <laughs> exactly. You have to be a certain, about a thousand feet from a school or anything that caters to children, mm. all these different things. And um, it's it's not as competitive as something like Oakland, where when Oakland was first doing their processes, it was, they'd release a request for proposal, it's called an RFP, and it's basically like a book report in school where you have to re like respond to all of these questions and you put it together in a report and then they grade them. And based on mm. the ranking and how mm. everybody scores mm. against each other, mm. then they allocate a certain amount of licenses. Like to the top tier exactly. book reports on how exactly. you would operate your dispensary. Exactly. I've competed in a municipality that made you do multiple RFPs. So for instance, they'll like they'll release the first one, the top three, top five get invited to do the second one. You get another RFP, you have to respond in the second one, and then Whoa. you have to do a public hearing and you have to do a public um, uh, like presentation and hold community meetings, and then you get your license. And that maybe gets filters for more of the cream of the crop, let's right, say. Right, exactly, exactly. But you know, I kind of like that process a little bit more. I, I've done well in that process. I don't think that I would have, I just, for some reason, like that works really well with me. I'm, I'm a competitive person and I use that as like drive to, to take it on. And plus with the deadlines, it kind of forces you to yeah. be on a specific yeah. track versus a land use one. It's like the landlord and maybe and sometimes and it just becomes, it could become a very expensive drawn out thing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I've always ended up competing for all of my permits on a local level. Yeah. 
Whoa, what an interesting way to also potentially filter for some of the best uh, proposals, like ideas for, um, uh, like, what, what, what could maybe some of the best things that you propose and some of the best things the other teams have been proposing across different counties and cities, states, et cetera, mm -hmm. um, could those best ideas be uh, added into uh, the ideal style of uh, running? Yeah, uh, definitely. I yeah. think after a while, I think in the beginning, because when you compete in a process like that, your application becomes public record and people can request it, right? So after a handful of these went out, a lot of the competitors requested everybody's information. Mm. And then so you go to the next town and you're like, wait a minute, they use that. That's mine. <laughs> you know mm -hmm. what I mean? But um, there's that sense that, yes, it's, it's kind of like the best of. I think where it gets interesting as far as innovation is concerned mm -hmm. is more on when you're grading and when they're grading these applications, they're typically grading them on a curve. They have no idea what the A is until every, they've read through everybody's thing. But what that forces you to do is to really take your time and try to like capture all of the thoughts and all of the benefits to the community in each particular section. So for instance, with security, let's high level. So security, you're like, okay, this is my security plan. This is what's standard. This is what the state wants. This is what the community wants, whatever. But what, how do I make this even better? Okay, I will offer up any data to the police department if, if they ever need it. Or I will have access to them that they can just log in and see our exterior cameras. Mm -hmm or um, I will hold community meetings on security um, once a month for the, the neighbors to come in and see if, and, and report anything or just be able to share their concerns. So it's those extra little things that I'm adding essentially give me extra points. Yeah. So then that way it's not just, okay, we have a security company, it's fine, check the box. It's really being thoughtful about how you can be efficient or mindful or a yeah. co good community leader, but in a way that's presented to a, a municipality. Mm, I like that, yeah. Efficient, mindful, good community leader rather than just checking the box. I think that's, that's a really actually beautiful ethic that can maybe also be brought to other industries yeah. uh, that are growing. So one, one thing that I would say is that, so, in cannabis, and this is where we're unique, as particularly in Northern California, it stemmed from the medical cannabis movement, right? Which always had a layer of compassion. So the first RFPs that came out always had a community benefits section and portion of it because we were expected to give a certain amount to people who couldn't afford it, people who were truly sick, people who were truly mm. needy. Mm. And so the RFP reflected that. They're like, okay, well, what are you gonna do for these people? But the first RFPs that came out also got cookie cuttered in a lot of different municipalities. Okay. So cannabis businesses, or at least a lot of them in Northern California, are upheld to the standard where we have to give back. It's like part of the business, it's part of our agreement with the city that we have to give a percentage of our profits or donate a certain amount of time to the communities. So that's something that cannabis companies are adhered to that are, hmm. are great and other yeah. and really other companies should be held to that same standard. Yeah, that you reside in a community that has other uh, people living in it and businesses in it and how do you uh, become a good community member and uh, with good morals and ethics and, and sh yeah, and sh share the fruits, especially of like high tech like those are some big fruits that could be better um, shared also. Um, inclusive stakeholding, all different types of cool stuff. Um, it also seems like going from like the indigenous days of just like having crops uh, and versus like now having governments that regulate the way that I use that, which just seems like a massively different like lifestyle, just a human like with their land and their different crops and um, and farms. I mean, I advocate for um, people to be able to grow their own cannabis. Like, people should have the right to grow their own cannabis for themselves and, and their family, period. Mm. Like, I, I'm a big believer and proponent of that. So, in that sense, I feel like you can still stay connected to the plant. Um, however, just to go on the flip side, what regulation has done is basically forced this almost impossible standard on growers to not use like 
harmful pesticides and have all of these nasty things, toxins that used to be regularly found in cannabis. And because of mm. regulation, we now like most all of the mm. all of the cannabis, they all pass. They don't have any of these yucky things in them anymore. So it's kind of nice in the sense that if you took raspberries from Whole Foods and put it under the same microscope and held it to the same standards as cannabis, it would not pass. But knowing that our industry now has developed methods of growing at mass production scale that can pass our super strict testing regulations, that's a huge win. And that was a win because of government and that was a win because of the regulators. Whoa, yeah, that's such an interesting way to view it. It's like, when can uh, regulation actually increase the safety of something that um, millions of people are actually using around the world? Yeah. yeah. That's when a, it first kicked in, I heard so many growers being like, it will never happen. We can't do this. We have to use these things. Guess you don't, <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, so. yeah, that, that's kind of stuff's really interesting. I like that point a lot. Um, Okay, two quick questions that we ask our guests on the way out. Are we in a simulation? Oh my gosh, I bet. I, you know what? I think I am. I really do think I am. Because my, whatever thing I'm in right now, <laughs> it's like, yeah. I don't know. I, maybe it's manifesting, or maybe it's just really like the law of attraction. But the simulation I'm in right now, it's like I am, just any energy, anytime I put a severe amount of energy towards something, it ends up happening. And I kind of dig it, but it's also a little weird. I'm, I'm like, mm -hmm. oh, it's, this is probably a simulation. <laughs> yes, okay. And then what do you think is the most beautiful thing in the world? My daughter. Mm. She's so cute. Tell us why. She, her, like, children, like, especially three year olds, their face glitter. Their eyes twinkle because they don't understand stress, they don't understand time, they don't understand deadlines, and they're, they just sparkle. And it is the most beautiful, hopeful, happy thing in the world. And they got mama nurturing them, oh and gosh. they don't gotta do the, <laughs> the bills for rent and food. No, and, yeah. no, not yet. Everything's yeah. just happy and get mama play with me. Play, You're like, okay. Play with me, yeah, yeah. We adults, I want to just recruit people, hey, play with me like adults and like yeah. start like playing with little like discs or dancing. I mean, that's when know. we all have the most fun. I mean, that's why we started Highland Events, right? Like for me, I love partying and I love to get people together and I love to like host things. I like the fanfare of it all, but then I also love cannabis. So it was just perfect. So this has been such a fun conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you for Alan. joining really us. Really appreciate on the show. it. Really, we really appreciate it. Thanks everyone for tuning in. We would love to hear your thoughts in the comments below on the episode. Let us know what you're thinking. Also, check out the links in the bio below to Salwa's work. Also, check out the links in the bio below to New West Summit. Mm -hmm. Support the artists, the entrepreneurs, the organizations, the leaders around your communities that you believe in. You can support simulation as well. Our links are in the bio below. And go and build the future, everyone. Manifest mm -hmm. your dreams into the world. We love you very much. Thank you for tuning in. We'll see you soon. It's a wrap. Good awesome. job. Good job. Um, proud of us. That was rocking. Awesome. I know. I was really good. That was so <laughs> fun learning from you. That was.